everyone. Thank you so much for attending today. My name is Stephanie Cristello. I'm the Director of Programming for Expo Chicago and the Editor-in-Chief of The Scene, Chicago's International Journal of Contemporary and Modern Art. Um, welcome to Expo Chicago and this year's edition of Dialogues, which is presented in partnership with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Dialogues is a year-round program of panels and symposia that culminates at the exposition, featuring leading artists, curators, and art professionals on the current issues that engage them. Today, we're really thrilled to be presenting this curatorial forum panel presented in partnership with Independent Curators International. Uh, thank you to Maria and Renaud for making all of this possible. The Curatorial Forum is uh, an exclusive program convening mid-career and established curators to discuss issues related to curating, programming, institution building, and audience engagement for global exhibitions. For the first time, as part of this Dialogues panel, we will be opening a portion of the forum to the public. Please join me in welcoming Romy Crawford, who's a Associate Professor for Visual Critical Studies and Liberal Arts at the School of the Art Institute, who will introduce our panelists, Naomi Beckwith and Valerie Cassell Oliver. Thank you. I'm actually not going to uh, properly introduce uh, Naomi and Valerie. I'm going to ask you all to. Uh, to speak to your current affili uh, affiliations, institutional affiliations, just really quickly, and then I want to jump into the conversation, just because we didn't we didn't plan that. Yeah. In that case, quick and dirty. Um, I am Naomi Beckwith. I'm the Marilyn and Larry Fields curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art here in Chicago, and happy to have an upcoming Howardina Pindell exhibition, co-curated with Valerie Cassell. Yay! <laughs> I'm Mallory Cassell Oliver, the former senior curator with the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston, and currently the Sydney and Francis Lewis Family Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. So. It's fresh. It's very fresh, very, very new. So um, we're going to start with the first slide. One of the things I, I was thinking about in one of the... Um, we had a pre-conversation where we, we worked out this title that we liked to, uh, quite a lot called Out of Body, um, and one that was going to relate to the issue of abstraction um, uh, by, uh, by, by African American makers. But um, before we jump into that, it seemed like a good idea to start with the body and to start with uh, um, some sort of context for why we would be thinking about a frame um, of, of out of body. So I decided to, to bring in a couple of slides uh, from a recent show that was at the New Museum under Song for a Cipher, um, a show of Lynette Yadom uh work. It was at the New Museum, just, just uh, went down recently. And while there are many, many cases of sort of the embodiment or the figure, the use of the black figure, um, in painting, Kerry James Marshall, Andy Wiley, uh, Packer, many, 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 many cases and examples. Lynette seems to be fitting for various reasons. One is that, the um, uh, most kind of timely reason is that, that they, Naomi was quoted a couple of times in a really great piece in The, the New Yorker about this show that was written by, um, by Zadie Smith. Um, and then also, while Lynette's work is, is figurative, again, it engages black bodies, you know, the stories that, that sort of precede these paintings, uh, if we go back to them, I don't know if we can, the stories that precede the people are absolutely abstracted. They're, they're fictional. They're made up. Um, and so she seems like a really interesting to me kind of bridge case for how uh, black artists are uh, kind of moving uh, from the body and figuration into sort of more abstract tendencies and impulses. So, you know, we start with the body, and then you're going to see very soon, I think if we start the role of the other slides, that we're going to be looking at work that, that uh, really uh, consciously and strategically disengages the black body within the scene of the, of the canvas. So, um, so this is all to say that our, our starting point uh, for out of body, again, is the body. So oddly, we're going to be seeing work that doesn't privilege uh, the body as the ultimate uh, painterly artis or artistic concern. But I do want us to query a couple of questions um, that nonetheless deal, deal with the body, the black body, I keep saying this, but also the body that shows up 
uh, as an historical weight. So that's to say not just black bodies, but other bodies that kind of carry this historical weight and bur burden, which might be from a range of races and eth ethnic backgrounds, of course, uh, the gender body, as well as the LGBTQ body, and the class body, right? So lots of bodies have this sort of historical weight, and yet we are really uh, thinking uh, semi, particularly around the case of Hardy and, and Pendel and other uh, black makers. So maybe the first thing to do is um, to ask you all about the lineage of makers who uh, work with and use the strategy of abstraction. Um, Alma Thomas, Hardin and Pendel, Jack Whitten. Can you sh talk about some of the work and some of the strategies that we see here in work by artists like this? Well, I think when you start, when you look at people like Alma Thomas, you have to think about the time frame in which the works were being made and why decisions were made to create the types of works that they were making at the time. Some of these are like from the late 1960s. You have Delilah Pierce, who comes even before that. And what was happening in the world at that time that one would want to create a moment in which the body is no longer present, um, in which one is in many ways free to have even more pointed or profound dialogues around race through a lack of representation, if you will. So I think it was used in many ways as a strategy to talk about more of the complexity of being black and being a person, a full person, rather than being relegated to one particular um, way of speaking, one particular narrative, one particular monolith uh, of self. It was a way of seeing and being able to embody all the multiplicity of selves. And in that way, um, allowing oneself to be the full, the full of who they are. Mm -hmm. uh, I think lately though, those dialogues have shifted around other issues. Again, you know, um, a certain kind of, when you look at Angel Otero, when he's looking at the story, the history of painting, and when and where he enters is someone coming from Puerto Rico, and the history of Puerto Rico, and a notion of wanting to, in many ways, kill the father, in other words, to assert the self. So I think these dialogues change across generations and change over time. I think that's a really fascinating way of entering into it. And I think it's also great that we start with images from Alma Thomas from the 60s. Because not only at that moment are we talking about a certain charged moment around black bodies, but what does it mean really to refute the figuration of that body? Um, Romy, in your beginning comments, uh, you reminded us, of course, what we were doing today, so thank you. Um, but I was also struck by the fact that in many ways the language around abstract painting is one that's always derived from landscape and a landscape tradition. And so what I think I'm really interested in doing in general in my work, but especially with this Pendale show, is try to imagine how we can rethink abstraction as a language that does come from the body. And when we talk about it coming from the bodies, we're talking about specific histories, specific cultural traditions. Um, and there are multiple ways in which those kind of histories and, and, and uh, cultural traditions get represented if not by figuration, perhaps in choice of material. And I think Angel Otero, again, is a really wonderful example of the way in which he could collect material from his home, from especially his grandmother's home, to think about a matrilineal lineage of a certain class position, a certain cultural position, and turn that into an art object that, even without the presence of a figure, could still speak to the specificity of a certain type of body. I think that's absolutely true. I mean, it's, um, it's interesting that, and maybe you all can talk about this, what are some of those cues? What are some of the cues that show kind of the, the trace of the body or the body that, you know, cannot sort of, is, is not there figuratively, but is there through, through other formal cues, material, surface, uh, color. You know, one might even say that the move towards black paintings and white paintings yeah. are, are kind of signifying on, uh, you know, two loaded uh, kind of bodies in a way. But what, what are some of the other cues? What's paradigmatic? about this sort of work that, that speaks to what Naomi is mentioning, where you know the body's kind of there, but not revealed. Well, I think about um, MacArthur Binion, who's an mm -hmm. artist right here in Chicago, and some of the large-scale abstract works that he would make that literally, what the earlier works, the more vertical works, were in many ways um, a representation of self. 
they were made to the height of himself, and the performative aspect of applying the material onto the surface, which was a very much a performative act. So leaving one's, the resonance of one's finger, prints, and hands onto the surface of the, of the paintings was really a way of being present and absent at the same time. Mm -hmm. You see Count just Strobert here. Um, this is from the exhibition Black in the Abstract that was presented at the Contemporary Arts Museum. Houston, um, some of the Afro-Cobra group, which we'll, we can certainly get into the politics of abstraction um, a bit later. But um, certainly MacArthur is one that I think completely, through the just creation of the work, is both present and absent uh, mm -hmm. in that work. Absolutely, I think that's a great, great example, the, the performative trace on the surface of the material. We talked about appropriating from one's life, from uh, one's home. I think you just pointed out something else too in blackness and abstraction, which is this really amazing ability for black cultural production to be interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean that what you're looking at, especially in the selection of images here, particularly through Afrocobra, is a kind of painting practice that's thinking about music that's thinking even about dance and other kind of performative traditions that have their own meter and their own tones and all these kind of terms that we use that can move back and forth between music and visuality. And so that sense of interdisciplinariness, I think, is a, has been a really important part of black cultural production yeah. that allows for this rethinking of what an abstract practice could be. Absolutely, and I was just looking because just beyond the um, James Phillips is Jason Moosen's work. And these are Kuji sweaters. Mm -hmm. So when you think about, I mean, taking this idea that Naomi so beautifully uh, intonated about music, which of course Frank Smith is here, and then uh, James Phillips, but then also looking at the 1980s as a moment and the signifiers of the black body, what black people wore, you know, in the 1980s to, in many ways, you know, all of the accoutrements of the day to all be condensed together within this beautiful object that he created, which is straight in line and in complete dialogue with members of Afro Cobra and then Abigail DeVille, just beyond that, her Harlem Door piece. Mm -hmm. So um, all within dialogue across time and geography, too. Mm -hmm. Can you all think of any cases, and I don't know, I can't remember the slides here, but are there any cases where there's a practitioner who's moving between these two impulses, uh, working with abstraction, and then in other projects working sort of with the figure? Oh my gosh. I was just looking at Fierle's work yeah. uh, at the Kemper. I mean, her ability to move in and out of the figure. And, and there are many others, but of course, now that I'm on stage, I can't remember anyone. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, that's yeah. just one in, in particular that <coughs> Well, I'm also thinking more historically about uh, Africa, where I would love for you to also jump in mm -hmm. here. Um, mm -hmm. Romy, for those of you who don't know, Africa was an artist collective that arose here in Chicago in the mid 60s on the South Side. And they were um, a group of artists who sort of formed together uh, mostly around the wall of respect. That was sort of the impetus of bringing these visual artists together. Um, at that time, uh, the wall of, well, with the wall of respect, they sort of formed with other sort of poets and performers, and then the visual artists sort of spun off and uh, did their own thing, um, which they called the African Commune of Bad Rebel yeah, Artists. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's yeah. right. um, bad is in badass. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so Afrocobra um, came up with a certain set of formal parameters yeah. for their productions. They produced manifestos, they workshopped. Uh, a series of projects until they came up with a certain set of um, uh, formal devices that they would use in their work and that would become signature Afrocoba dress shoes. And so one of them... Things like color. The Kool-Aid yeah, color. The Kool-Aid color. You yeah. have to use yeah. Kool-Aid color, bright colors, right. to sort of represent the vivacity of black people. Mm -hmm. um, but another one of which, which is my favorite, kind of phonetically, is uh, Midpoint at my niece's. And midpoint at my nieces for Afrocobra meant finding a way um, to represent both the figure and development abstraction 
in harmony. Mm -hmm. And there was a kind of synthesis of the figure and of abstraction because they understood abstraction as a kind of lang language of modernism. And it was important for them to say that we understand this language, but it was also important for them as a kind of activist piece to make sure that the black body was figured. And there, there in does lie a very early uh, you know, moment, a sampling mm -hmm. of people who can integrate both the figur figuration with abstraction mm -hmm. in the most complex and beautiful ways. I would say one of the, the more complex aspects of their practice also was even the, the move towards collectivity. Collective mm -hmm. practice is, a, is really kind of fascinating um, you know, kind of case of how uh, it's not a singular body, exactly. but the body becomes sort of a collective body, a single organism that then is the figure, mm -hmm. stands in for the figure, and, and they were thinking in really astute ways about that. Um, well, I just wanted to point out that this is Donald Moffat, and yeah. he is not African American, just so you know. <laughs> but we, we can, we, we can, we can it adapt. Is, it is about excusing <laughs> the body and yet representing the body. Uh, many will know um, Donald as being a part of the whole movement that um, uh, Grand Fury, you know, he was very much active in and around issues around AIDS. And, uh, and this, um, for many years, he actually stopped painting and he became a pastry chef. Mm -hmm. um, and then when he returned, he returned utilizing the, the language, visual language that he had learned um, um, as, as a chef. And this is actually representational of a sort of glory hole for those who may or may not know what that is. Um, but uh, I had the distinct pleasure of working with Donald in 2011 to organize a survey of the extravagant game. But it struck me that the same issues he was dealing with as a gay white male were the same issues that many um, black male, black female artists, Latino, Asian artists were dealing with when you're talking about abstraction in a particular time and place where it's very much um, uh, hyper heterosexual and hyper white and hyper male. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about to both of you in your curatorial practices. I mean, this convening is actually under the aegis of the kind of curatorial form, right? And in your curatorial practices, both of you do something that I think is really great and cool. You 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 work with living artists. Uh, you work with artists that you know or tend to know. You you. Uh, you utilize the methods of interview a lot through your research. And so one of the things that we can ask you um, that you could share with us is what do the artists, uh, our artists like Haradina, for instance, since you're working on her show right now, what do they say about their use of this? So how, of course, you know, we're talking about artist agency and, and not just sort of the, the view of abstraction from the perspective of the, the audience or the person who's seen the work, but how the artists are really kind of consciously u utilizing this. What shown up to you as interesting about how Howardina, Howardina talks about the use of abstraction? It's funny. Um, well, first of all, thanks yeah. for the compliment. Yeah. Um, <laughs> whenever one speaks to artists, you find a kind of range of, of both, I would say, responses to their own cultural practice, but also, I think, even a sense of awareness uh, mm -hmm. about the, um, the intentionality of what goes into the work. So mm -hmm. on the one hand, you have Afro-Cobra artists who were so incredibly intentional about being articulate about exactly what they were trying to do. Because as you say, Val, there was a political urgency around that. Now, Howard Dean, on the other hand, is sort of a grand experimenter, yeah. right? And super intuitive, and mm -hmm. she just kind of rolls through it, and what comes out, comes out, to the point that I think, um, as we speak to her about certain developments in her work, and we can talk deeper about that in a moment, um, she seems to have a kind of a, a kind of an awareness, a sudden awareness. Oh, like, oh I guess I did do that. <laughs> no, didn't I? Uh, they were, we were looking at something, and uh, about what it was, that it had the nails driven, we were looking at Nkisi figures, and we're like, well, isn't it interesting that you, at this time, were looking at the sort of uh, accumulation, the use of nails in a lot of the early works on paper, where she would put string and pieces of chat together, but there were also nails there. Mm -hmm. And she traveled so extensively, uh, and she thought, oh, yes, that's, yes, like, maybe subconsciously it was there, I mean, artists are sponges, and, and, and things don't, aren't always apparent. They're not always obvious uh, when they show up in the work. And that's where 
the beauty of working with living artists is, is that it's a constant exchange that takes place. As a curator, you have a, a capacity to bring information to them that they may embrace or reject. Uh, and they have the capacity to bring information to you and you have the ability to expand the context of that. Mm -hmm. For me, the beauty of working with living artists is there, it's just simply a platform mm -hmm. uh, in which they get to amplify, they get to have their voices and their ideas amplified. And my job is to simply place it within a trajectory and a context. That's mm -hmm. my job, not to, not to impose yeah. You know. I think it's so important not to come with the grand theory first mm -hmm. and then work the artist through that grand theory. It's so important to really have this dialogue up front and do that series of discoveries together. And I think that's really important to come as someone who's ready to learn, mm -hmm. um, not just ready to kind of produce a very specific body of knowledge. But I think what I've also heard very specifically from Howard Dina inside and outside of moments of discovery and through other artists is a sense that their work cannot be neutralized, mm -hmm. which is another kind of term I think that we give to abstraction. So the first one that I would like to debunk is pure landscape and I think the second one would be this idea that abstraction mm -hmm. is somehow a neutral, fully just, purely expressive Devoid language. of any yeah. kind of narrative. Devoid of meaning or narrative or content. And mm -hmm. I think um, Howard Dina and many other artists are really interested in both context and content in their work. Yeah, so you, I think that's a really profound point. That it's not that even though Howardina and other artists that we're talking about um, may sort of work semi-intuitively or sort of feel in their way, this is not to say that the that improvisation, something I've been thinking a lot about this semester with some of my students, um, that that improvisation, it does not come with a, a set of, uh, with expertise, you know, with a context of expertise, a grounding of research, grounding of travel, a grounding of information that allows them to sort of, you know, be free from the figure, right? Because in a lot of ways, you know, let's, let's maybe talk about the, the radical move towards abstraction. It is, it is tough to, let's talk about kind of markets a little bit or even exhibitions. It's tough to move away from the figure. The figure is salacious, it's pretty, it's cute, it's sexy, and then you have this other sort of thing that's um, harder for, to be legible mm -hmm. to audiences. And some of these artists have had have, have, have difficult uh, times, right? Uh, and this is, I think, especially in the case of the African American artists that we're talking about, and artists of color, um, uh, in the marketplace, because they don't have black bodies in the, you know, the spectacle eyes. Not only in the marketplace. I mean, consider someone like Phil Rath Hines, who a lot of people would never have known. There's a certain level of anonymity right. uh, that happens, especially with older generations who were working in abstraction. Phil Rath Hines, an amazing hard edge abstract painter, African-American, living in Washington, D.C., conservator at the Hirshhorn Museum. This piece is called Kelly White. Why? Because he worked on Ellsworth Kelly's work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, but did a tremendous amount of work and has literally, really is somewhat of an obscure figure. Mm -hmm. People do not know who Phil Rathons is. Um, they are being discovered, and I say that in quotation marks, the market has discovered them. And therein lies a particular politic there, too. I mean, I, I, when I think about all of the institutions within communities that have supported these artists over the years, the galleries, the site-specific, ethnically-specific museums that showed the work, that supported the work, in light of a larger market suddenly discovering them, there is a complete erasure of that history, of the ecology that existed to support these artists. And I think there, therein lies a rub that I'm not very comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Well, you all are doing, I mean, it's speaking with Kelly Jones last week about this a little bit. I mean, you, the two of you and Kelly Jones and other people are doing a lot to recuperate or rediscover or whatever it is, kind of bring to the fore some of these makers. Um, and I do recall um, hearing the two of you speak with Haradina a couple of months ago. And in a very cute moment, she made jokes about how weird it was to be kind of discovered at this age slash stage in her life. Um, you know, can you say a little something about that, working with her? What is it like to launch these careers? We, we, some of us have been, uh, this is the second conversation where there's been a little bit of laughter around the fact that artists are finding, some of these artists especially, are finding their moment at 70 and older. 
And it's incredible. 70, what do you, older, 70 and especially women of color. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what, what we're also talking about really are um, broader institutional issues around our practice. And by institutions, I don't just mean museums, mm -hmm. but I'm talking commercial galleries, critics, um, publications, all sorts of things that, you know, at times, in the best of times, are not so moving in lockstep, mm -hmm. and then other times are very much supporting um, uh, very specific things. And um, we're looking at a lot of artists who were around at the heyday of conversations around abstract expressionism, exactly. but somehow have been totally excluded. We'll come to even uh, in this presentation a work by Stanley Whitney, mm -hmm. who would describe himself sitting in the corner of the Cedar Tavern as a young black man and kind of looking at Jackson Pollock next to like <laughs> Clement Greenberg, and you know, so for all these writers in the New York Times, and they would just like, you know, they would kind of shun him and say, "You're not allowed at our table," mm -hmm. which on the one hand, maybe a true story about, you know, a mean girl type social practice, but it says everything about the support that you're going to get for your career. Mm -hmm. So we happen to be in a lucky moment now, mm -hmm. where again, these men, especially women of color, I'm looking at a beautiful Helen Ameida uh, works in a, another sort of booth here at the fair, another woman in her 70s, we've mm -hmm. got Howard Dina around. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at Carol Rama too, right, I mean, right outside these mm -hmm. doors. Um, that's wonderful, but it is a bit of a weird lockstep moment where the market and critics and art history seem to be in this mode of a kind of archaeological mode. Yeah. And I'm happy for folks, but I think it's a good lesson for all of us to make sure that we're looking broadly right. at every given historical moment. No, I think you're absolutely right. And, and again, you know, you had artists who were creating work, who were in dialogue. I mean, artists generally don't care uh, what what particular framework you come from, your ethnic background. It's, it's the way that you're working and a sort of community that's created and somehow when narratives get written other people get written out of those narratives mm -hmm. uh, they tend to be women they tend to be people of color but there are also other white men that get written out of narratives and so really to really uh, to create a very holistic realm in which we're all sort of like digging from the same well or all drinking from the same streams and at times you've got to and, and to frame that properly, you've got to go back and, and recover, recover these dialogues because otherwise they feel very hollow, they feel very shallow if they don't have the sort of call and response, if they don't have the people who were at the table engaged in practices all back together again. I think we're all the richer, um, those who live and breathe and work within this field, we're all the richer when those conversations are reconstituted. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not like they, these people worked over here and these people worked over there. And yet, given that, there were places where Howardina would talk about being at Yale mm -hmm. in the 1960s, um, being a woman, being black. I think William T. Williams was also there. But considering of all the students at Yale, they were very few. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the rigor of the moment to work with minimalism, to work, you know, Al Hellhead was there. So you had a whole sort of pedagogy that was being taught. Even though she worked in figuration coming into Yale, by the time she leaves Yale, she's completely abstract. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has everything to do with, you know, that history and, and who you study with. Uh, she studied under Albers uh, as well, so this notion about color and how that comes in. So uh, sometimes we get so fixed firm in talking about the artists and, and their bodies, and which they, you know, in many ways try to push us beyond that conversation. We forget the sort of more formalist structures that mm -hmm. enables them to get and arrive at certain places. Yeah, yeah great point. Um, you know, this is, it, you know, we're in a, in a, in a time period also, this, this present moment, 2016, 2017, where the gendered body means less and less, right? So there's a, you know, I think the gendered body right now means less than it did even five years ago. And one might, I don't think I, you know, I don't feel, I think I feel comfortable saying that the racialized body means less and less, just given current political conditions and social events. But there was that feeling <laughs> 10 years ago that the racialized body might mean less, um, signify less. And I, I guess what I'm wondering is that is abstraction, does, is, is abstraction, you know, a, a, a kind of visual, the way the visual arts sector marks that kind of implosion of 
gender, race, identity. Um, and so maybe this is a really, maybe it's not just a, a lucky moment, but also, in, and also in the institutional practices that you're talking about, Valerie, but also sort of a moment of readiness in terms of letting go of now, babe, that body. Mean, mean letting go of that body. <laughs> body is not being let go. Yeah. It's not. No, I mean, come on, y'all, let's be real. It is not let go. I live in Richmond, Virginia. Yeah, I, I know. Okay? <laughs> Let's be real about it. Squat body ain't going nowhere. It's not going anywhere. There's an article, and I hate, yeah, I was just reading the uh, Wall Street Journal. There's a small article uh, about a young boy, eight years old, in New Hampshire, who was recovering because other classmates literally tried to lynch him. This black body is not going anywhere. It's not. You know, we can, we can applaud the complexity of this body. I don't want to be anything but black. I, I'm like Danny Martinez. I have never, I could never imagine <laughs> wanting to be white. I am who I am. I don't want to be anything but who I am. I, I love who I am. I'm, I am the result of many generations of people. I, I want to be who I am. And I ask that exactly because mm -hmm. I'm wondering if the, you know, the, these, are, these are key time spaces then to maybe move into it more aggressively, right? So, so I, I don't want to be flattened. And I think this is the truth of all artists, regardless of your background. No artist wants to be two-dimensional. Mm -hmm. There is more to being alive than just being black and being female. I, there, I am more complex, but I don't negate who I am. I just want to be free to explore the full complexity of who I am. I think that's spot on. And, and um, in a certain way, I do agree with you, Romy, that there are all these kind of pressures put on the definitions um, of a certain types of bodies. And I think the question around gender has probably been one of the more important ones around identity um, in the last probably decade. I'm mm -hmm. super excited by the gender queer movement for that very reason. But I think that the pressure that's coming from that movement isn't necessarily um, one that denies specificity, mm -hmm. but that's one that's about trying to find the locations of things like sexism. Mm -hmm. Right? Because even though, let's say, gender may be a bit more fluid, a structure called sexism still exists. And I think it's the same conversation about race. There may be ways in which people are talking through race in multiple ways, but that doesn't deny or negate the idea that there is a structure called racism, that there are suprimitive structures in the world that are very much active and will find ways to activate itself no matter how identities begin to shift. And I don't think any of the artists here would, would deny any of that. Yeah, no, I, I actually was not saying anything. No, I didn't, I didn't that. mean to say but, that. But I, I just wanted yeah. to get real for a moment. That's yeah, right. yeah. I, I, yeah. Um, <laughs> But, you know, d d gives us an opportunity to just, you know, sort of talk about the complexity versus, you know, the simplicity, right? So abstraction did, I think, for a lot of black makers, um, signal, and other makers as well, signal, signal a way to be more complex and more sophisticated, kind of have a, a more, uh, again, sort of um, uh, kind of dialectical approach and relationship to some of these things we're talking about, right? Uh, very beautiful but, nuanced moments. Okay, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at Jenny Jones, and so... What I love about this new generation, about this nuance, is that even in creating work, she's bringing along a whole history of free jazz mm -hmm. that she's imparting for those who really want to know about the work. You cannot really appreciate Jenny's work. She's as much a, a musical historian mm -hmm. and an ethnomusicologist in that respect than she is a painter. Mm -hmm. So she's bringing that history along, this obscure, forgotten, history about free jazz mm -hmm. into the realm of the visual arts. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. Going back to what we talked about earlier with this kind of multidisciplinary way in which many artists, especially black artists, have thought about cultural production. But um, I wanted to go back to another point about sort of complexity versus simplicity, which I also want to say that um, this idea of making something more complex is really a signal to an audience. 
right? It has nothing to do with one's life, one's biography, the way one exists in the world. I mean, any person, um, any person understands as an individual that there are multiple ways in which we are being in the world. And there are multiple ways in which we get obscured, but we have to kind of work for and against that. I think sometimes these intentional shifts toward um, abstraction are actually nothing but signals to historians, critics, curators, to maybe like obscure some things and make you work just a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a way, I mean, we are, is, well, I won't call myself a historian, I'm a curator. I work with I'm artists. Oh, I'm a curator. I'm just, you know, I'll let everybody right, else do that thing. Right. But, you know, but I think what, I think in many ways the onus is on curators too who um, attempt to bridge, become a bridge to more, to the, the general public where we, we sometimes collapse language in order for the expediency of, of setting uh, a, a message. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a cue for us to be a little more cognizant of that mm -hmm. and, and not flatten that out as well. And not allow our PR departments and development departments to do that as well. I mean, mm -hmm. we have to take the onus on that. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. Not to be lazy mm -hmm. and not to presume one signal or one symbol in one place means exactly the same thing elsewhere. Or that it means the same thing through different forms. One of the things that really showed up for me um, while I was thinking about talking with you all about this formally, I know we've kind of engaged it informally, and the, all of us and uh, each of us individually, um, is, so I guess the, the question is around form, but the thing that, that has come up to me that I've been doing a lot of photography research, and the way it's actually really hard to mark out a category of abstraction in photography by black makers. Again, because of the fascinating appeal, especially in the period I look at the kind of 60s and 70s, of kind of black bodies captured on film um, that, sh that demonstrate a type of, of kind of, you know, uh, beauty, aesthetics, and agency, right? And so actually now, I'm thinking a lot, oh, where is the, where's the category of, 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 of images of trees and cars and flowers, et cetera, by black photographers? They're there. They are actually there in the archives, but those are not the thing that looks at. There's just an incredible amount of excitement around the black portrait studios and the Van Der Zee and people, black people dressed up and looking good and all that kind of thing from the 20s to the present. And there's not really any concern for um, experimental experimentation of photography. And it's there. It's right there in the archives. So, so yeah, I think these, these things are flattened and we always have to be really careful about keeping them nuanced and, and buoyant and, and convex. And at the same time, they're really good cues for paying attention to forms even that we're not uh, thinking about this through, yeah. I think we. Oh. Yeah, we yeah. have to come to a point where yes. we have a few minutes just to talk through Howard Dina yeah. as a um, as a particular case study. Um, as we mentioned before, she's someone who's at Yale studying uh, color theory, studying incredibly formal abstract work, and producing things like you saw on the slide before, these kind of works on paper that play with the grid, and some color devices, simplistic shapes on a, on a sort of color field. And then almost immediately moving into New York, she starts making these templates. She would um, basically paste together sheets and sheets of manila folders and sort of six foot, eight foot kind of rolls and hole punch these bad boys. You have rolls of hole punches. This is before going Carpal across. Tunnel. Yeah, before Carpal <laughs> Tunnel was invented. Um, but she would tack those templates to the surface of a camera, excuse me, to a canvas and then spray paint them or sometimes with some hand painting but mostly spray paint through it so that you would get these really beautiful kind of uh, fields of diaphanous color on the surface of a canvas. And in a way, this is a moment where she's abandoning a traditional paintbrush. Right, no, and, and, and again, she leaves Boston University into Yale and almost immediately, the, the very figurative work becomes very abstracted, even though there is a remnant of figure there, and jumps right into the grid, right into color experimentation, color theories, um, and then these templates, which are really quite beautiful. Is it High Time, Hard Times? Yes. Has really beautiful images of her in the studio making these pieces. And you see her with the, the mask because she's very fastidious about her health yes. and, um, and, and uh, production and creating and get this beautiful depth. Uh, and I'm also really interested in the way that these began to to question the very existence of painting. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can we call this a painting? 
Right. If she's not making gestures on the canvas. And right? these, and, and many of these, I can't remember, but these are actually sewn. I know the later works mm. in the 70s, 70, 70 by 72, well, the space frame, which mm. is um, um, untitled space frame, soft space frame. Uh, this is a work on paper. Mm -hmm. Uh, but she has very interesting ideas about where the grid comes from. So I love the idea that we're talking about. I just brought up Yale, but then I love the fact that her dad was a mathematician. Um, that the notion of the grid, the notion of numbers, also comes uh, from a very early childhood memories of the father uh, writing down uh, the numbers from the odometer when they travel and working on graph paper and doing that. So in many ways, it's this sort of macro-micro which somehow converges and gets collapsed, uh, particularly in the later works on paper where you do see the numbers. And then she plays with the idea of the grid. So here's her in a kind of Klaus Oldenburg moment, you know, playing with this notion of what is the ultimate in the language of modernism. And she said, you know what? I'm going to make a big bad grid, yeah. like a big bad painter would do, but I'm going to make it flaccid. <laughs> I'm going to make it soft and hanging there. Yes. <laughs> soft and dangly. <laughs> but she does it by sewing, yes. using what's traditionally considered a woman's labor to then create this kind of painting. Yeah, this is where we were talking about, the, where I was talking earlier about the grid and the numbers and the chat. So she tells a beautiful story of Carl Solway coming into her studio. And as Naomi spoke about, um, these manila folders, which she would uh, punch these holes and would have pals and piles of paws, what I call chats, these little pieces, the remnants uh, from the hole punches. And Carl Solway said, well, what's all this from? And she explained her process. And then he said, well, how many are here? And she said, I don't know. I've never counted them. And she starts counting them. And hence the numbers start appearing. And then, um, as with wonderful things, letters also start to appear in these as well. But most importantly, she never throws anything away. Never. And they now appear on the surface of these incredible drawings. I mean, what you would call a drawing, yes. but they're really more awesome blouse works. And on the work on the right, you can see that grid sort of structure underneath. Right. Um, and it's literal kind of a cat's cradle grid, as she calls mm -hmm. it, on the, um, on the surface of these things that become three-dimensional. Um, and then on the left, you will not be able to see that so clearly, but she starts adding things like powder to it. Powder Perfume. And string. Exactly, right. and more string. And so she's experimenting a lot with material, mm -hmm. but she's also, I think, adding this kind of female bodily dimension. So again, we're coming back to the idea mm -hmm. that these works are closer to bodies mm -hmm. than they are to landscape. And then, of course, it You're shows up on a macro work. level, yeah. So here's a painting. So we showed you works from paper before that are, you know, 12 by 9, 12 by 10, or what have you. And then all of a sudden, we're dealing with feet and feet and feet of, of, of canvases. So here's a work that the MTA acquired a few years ago. That is a canvas that's been cut and sewn together to make this large, almost a billboard size object where she does a very similar technique that she did on the work on paper. And it is talcum powder. It's, it's talcum glitter. Powder. It's glitter. Uh, it's string. perfume. Yes. It is all sorts of things that make it a bodily thing. And here's some close-up sort of images of that. So you can see all that handiwork with thousands and thousands of those paper chats on the cover. Um, I'm getting a signal that we're coming to actually the end of the panel, which is oh, terrible. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> which is really terrible. But very quickly, uh, 1979 was a big turning point in her life, but also in the art world. There was a show downtown at the uh, Art Space Gallery called Nigger Drawings. And as you imagine, a lot of people had a problem with that being the title of the show, but this became a massive issue within the art world in New York at that time, where there was a kind of pro and con, there were pro and con factions. Pro were mean necessarily not pro that language, they yeah. say, but they were pro free speech. Yeah. Uh, con, of course, um, were con racist. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, Howard Dina begins to participate in a series of these protests against racism in the art world, leaves her job as a curator at Puma, where she had been for 12 exactly. years, the first black woman mm -hmm. to be a curator at the Museum of Modern Art I in New York. I was about to say, we just so glanced over the fact that Howard Dina is so complex, not only as an artist, but also as a curator. So it's wonderful to be a curator working with a curator yeah. uh, who's now an artist. But um, yeah. yeah, and she also has a massive car accident that year. So she we have. She starts at SUNY. Exactly. And en route to SUNY. Literally crashes, crashes on the way to her new job. 
So we're talking about a woman that has a near-death experience, but also is politicized. And so her work thereafter takes on a new type of tone. And a massive head injury. So that feeds into the, what these images become. Absolutely. Here's so our first video. Tell us a little about when the show opens, where it's going to be, all of that. Oh, if it's going to be like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, we want to hear more about this, but just make sure that we, we know where all well, this is Well, let's just scroll through yes, this, and we'll yeah. talk about the yeah. exhibition. Okay. It opens, what, the 24th of February? February 24, 2018. It opens at the MCA. And, and then, then we'll August travel. 25th through... I forgot. Yeah, the Open to August 25th. And, the <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll be a third venue. A third venue in Boston. Um, but very quickly, we'll just say that she continues to do this kind of work, even through her new radicalized phase. Mm -hmm. But she stars a new series of work that we see are now titled. Before everything is untitled, almost everything is untitled. Mm -hmm. And now you have a series of work called things like Memory. Memory. Because of the head injury. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So she's starting yeah. to try to reconstruct her life. Um, she starts doing works about her travels. Mm -hmm. So here's a wonderful work about Brazil. Mm -hmm. um, and she starts trying to reconstruct the sense of herself, both in the literal sense, pulling work in from her life, but also in a larger metaphorical sense. What does it mean to be the product of the Great Migration? Right. What does it mean to be the product of the uh, Triangle Trade? Right. Um, what she does was it born mean? Raised in Philly, so. Yes, of course. Yeah. And what does it mean to be a black woman located on Earth now? Right. And all the, the sheer injustices. So a lot of the autobiography deals with the Middle Passage, uh, who uh, her people are, uh, who she becomes. And again, it comes out of a moment of needing to reconstruct self because the head injury is severe enough where, you know, for many times she would say she could barely, um, you know, sit upright for periods of time. Um, and here's someone who had a very rich very full and very rich life and very history even as a young woman, as a child growing up in Philadelphia, uh, to suddenly have to stitch together these things again. Um, and then realizing the, the sheer, so she's always been a bit of an, ad, uh, an advocate um, from her time being a curator, uh, really advocating for people of color, was one of the founders of the Air Gallery, which was founded for women artists, uh, was a part of the whole PESS, which was sort of a sister group to the Guerrilla Girls. Uh, so there's always been a sense of advocacy there. Absolutely. But what she never lost was this real sense of working with those same forms that she started with from Yale on thinking about figures, thinking about shape, thinking about a sort of language of formalism that also then feeds into the return of the figure into her work. And what we realize is that it's more of a spiral, that um, the works, the ways in which she works, uh, she works in long arcs over periods of time. So you'll see things that she began in the early 1970s that she continues well into the 2000s. So she has an amazing case of how, within abstraction, the body is present through the stories, the narratives, her, her autobiography, etc. And sometimes and even fluid, but we won't tell you yeah, which works out that. Yeah, those stories. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we're supposed to open up for questions if there's yeah. time. We have, we have 10 minutes for questions. And um, if you wouldn't mind, um, could you wait for the microphone that someone will bring to you if you have a question? Just raise your hand. Fairly in the back. Um, so to bring it back to that one concrete moment of the body, um, in thinking of ideas of even imagining a, a body of color in the future, how in a lot of fiction, especially science fiction, there were never black and brown bodies in there or if they were, they were usually post-apocalyptic or marginal. And so, in this idea of rebuilding, and now that it's so charged, we're redoing all this literature that has our bodies present. So, just thinking how you, where do you think that fits within this embrace of abstraction that's happening and this reminding of, of what, of race, how we're, in some ways worse off now than we were 30, 40 years ago. 
So can I add a quick nerdy sort of rejoinder to that, which is um, there are actually moments where black bodies were appearing in historic fiction, but they've just been written out or they don't show up in, let's say, the TV versions of these things. So Ursula K. Le Guin had black characters, what would be called black characters in her sort of crazy futuristic novels. Um, so they're there. And then you have incredible uh, science fiction writers like Samuel Delaney and um, Octavia Butler, um, which are very mindful of black bodies. And in, in historical times, you talk about the whole Dutch colonies in New York. I mean, Octavia Butler was actually doing research uh, long before the uh, African burial <laughs> project. So um, there's a very rich history there. Um, but I think also there is something I want to caution about because as a, I'm a big fan of Afrofuturism and this sort of idea that we as beautiful black bodies have come from Saturn to kind of populate the earth with new Saturn. knowledges. Oh, girl, yes, <laughs> all of that. <laughs> but I do want to caution against a sense of escapism around that because when you begin to say that we originate on Saturn, you begin to deny a kind of concrete history that also, I think, needs to be addressed. Well, we've got to talk about Sun Ra then. <laughs> One quick aside, though, there is a big push against Afrofuturism now, and I think in, a, in, a, in disavowing it and saying we are beyond this imagining of ourselves in, in space, that we are concrete bodies that have realities now, I think that is sometimes limiting. Um, and the to create a space beyond what we have now is important. But and also, Afrofuturism, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think Afrofuturism is interesting, not just about sort of the move towards Saturn or something like that, but that it implies that black bodies can sort of uh, be in, in places and contexts that they, they could not normatively be in. So again, even the kind of making that we're talking about, the, the making of abstract work, that's a type of move towards it's a possibility that I think, so, so I think what's happening too with Afrofuturism where people are being open to, to less than the literal, to more than the literal reads of it. Like it's not about just going to Saturn, it's about sort of just going downtown if in 1920 you couldn't go downtown. And, right. You know, that kind of thing. So it's, it's a type of mobility, it signals mobility, but it doesn't mean the, the move towards the moon, you know. Hi, um, so I'm really interested in this uh, sort of moment of crisis in Howard Ian Pinnell's um, history in which she turns really starkly to representation from a kind of history of really intense abstraction. Um, and I guess I wanted to hear you maybe talk about um, like the medium specificities of abstraction representation or um, you know if like if there are devices that Howard Ian has interested in across mediums for um, maintaining her abstraction um, throughout her career? Well, uh, yeah, I was thinking about her, the conceptual work that she also did, the video drawings, um, which is away from painting, of course. Uh, it's something completely different, but takes into account a lot of the devices she used in uh, creating the abstract works, the sort of vector movements um, and shifts. Uh, long, I don't think we had it. Do we have any video drawings in here? Um, so she also moves from painting into conceptual practices and then back into painting. So um, I think she's even the works on paper, um, which is a full series of, um, they've never ever been figurative, the, the painting works, though. So. Yeah, I think that's an important point that it's not just a kind of trajectory. There are really several sort of um, parallel practices happening at the same time. But to go back to the question of what really held over, um, I put up this work, an autobiography work, um, because in many ways you see a figure appearing and there is a kind of painted figure in there. But there's a very particular way in which this body appears. And that is what Howard Dina did was first off uh, cut and sew a canvas like she would have done in the earlier works. I showed you details from a work, um, a 77 work where you see that very well. Um, um, to create the figure, first of all, the painting is done to her height. So there is the, already the reference to the body, much in the same way you talked about MacArthur Binion doing that same thing. But the way the figure appears here actually is that she laid down on a canvas and drew an outline of her body onto the canvas, cut that out, and then re-sewed that into in that same sort of technique that she'd been using before. So there is not this kind of a return to a Renaissance realist representation um, of, fig of a figure and figuration. There is already that kind of handicraft 
that she had before that brought the work, in, uh, brought the figure into there. And I should also say, as we were sort of mentioning before, there are multiple ways in which the body can appear without being literal. And one of those appearances is this form of labor, this kind of performative gesture that we talked about through MacArthur Binion and others. And so the action of cutting and sewing for, I would argue for Howard Dean, is already about the appearance of the body working on the canvas. Also very fragmented here, but the body shows up very fragmented. Yes. And I was really struck too, even with the free white in 21, the fluidity of the body mm -hmm. to move in between um, um, appearances, mm -hmm. um, to go from the black body to the sort of transformed black body in white face, to literally go from black to white within the spectrum. And moving back and forth, talking back and forth to self, these sort of multiple facets or um, persona, this persona that she takes on. And also I think there's a question that we have to ask about that work, which I mean, many of you may not have seen it, but essentially, as Valerie said, it's a kind of conversation with oneself. Howardina is talking through all these stories from her life and even her family's life, her mother's life, where she's encountered racism. And then there's this kind of super ego white voice that comes in and tells her she's crazy, mm -hmm. that she's made this up, that this really doesn't, it, A, it didn't happen, and if it did, it doesn't count. You can't talk about this in art practice, i.e. she's rehearsing <laughs> the yeah. things that she's been told as an artist. But I think it's interesting that she can inhabit both voices. What does it mean that she's aware of her own narrative and can very, um, very aptly articulate that, but also she knows the voice of the other. She can inhabit it. And the question is, how sensitive are we as people to be able to inhabit the voice of the other? Well, it's so beautiful because I've forgotten what booth it is, but there's a, um Adrian Piper work yeah. from the same period of time. Lady Gorby? Um, I'm, I'm like a walking Yes, abbot. thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Yeah. A beautiful piece, uh, which is exactly that. It is the language which you which she heard. Yeah. Uh, you're making it up. You're making too much of this. You're, you know, and, and it's beautiful that it comes out of the same time frame. Amazing talk by three amazing women. Um, I just wanted to give you a small, uh, uh, whatever, in, uh, insight on the AIR connection. Howard Denna wasn't an AIR. AIR was predominantly white women artists, but she was in an exhibition that Anna Mendieta curated called The Dialectics of Isolation, which invited a number of artists like Howard Denna, Senga Nagundi, um, who else was in it? Judy Baca, which was kind of to highlight that AIR did not have the, that kind of membership. So Howard Denna was the bridge in a certain way for AIR to understand its maybe lack of you know, lack of political awareness in the world at that time. Well, I thought she was a, one of the she founders. She was actually a founding yeah. member. She was a founding yes. member of AIR, and we actually yes. have a painting by Sylvia Slay, yeah. another founding member She's with her in it. She was one of the twenty founders. Ah. But the way Howard Dean tells it, she actually uh -huh. gave it his name, but you know, whatever. We can, we can make that apocryphal. <laughs> but, but she was like Jane Eyre. Exactly. She said it was, uh, initially she wanted to entitle it Jane Eyre. Eyre, meaning Jane Eyre. Right. But then they went with A-I-R. But I she see. is one of the founders. I stand humbled and correct. But you are, you are correct that Anna Mendieta then did do a show called The Dialectics of Art. Oh, was she still in the collective at that time when di the dialectics She was moving out of the collective, collective at, right. exactly, at that time. And so Anna Mendieta had been invited to do this show of what they call third world women artists. Um, Back at the time. Exactly. And that is a show where this seminal video, Free White in 21, was debuted. So this is something that came up. This is wonderful, a really interesting moment, I think. So if people don't know, this is the AIR Gallery in New York City. Um, but uh, do you, so you all, from your research and interviews, she mentioned to you that she wanted to be called AIR? AIR after Jane. 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 No, yeah. Yeah. And so, so yeah, this is a really great moment to, to clarify that, I guess, in the research and in the book, right? Okay. Especially so, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I think that's going to be it for now. Our time is up. Thank you so much for speaking. Thank you, guys. Yeah.